Published in 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula was largely responsible for the growing popularity of the vampire, a term penned as early as 1734. German filmmaker F.W. Murnau was sued for his 1922 film Nosferatu on claims from the Stoker estate that it was a copy of the novel's plot. Bela Lugosi filled the cape for his first official appearance on the silver screen in 1931, and playwright Hamilton Dean first adapted the tale for the stage in 1942 as The Vampire Play, which was redesigned in 77 by Gothic artist Edward Gorey. By the time he made his first video game appearance in Ghost Manor for the Atari 2600 in 1983, he had already become the leader of an elite group of horror icons. The Count went on to cameo in King's Quest II, Romancing the Throne, and three games in 1986, Realm of the Undead for the ZX Spectrum, and two self-titled releases for the Commodore 64. There were the first British games to receive a 15 certificate from the Board of Film Censors for their gory images. The same year, Konami, known for developing PC, MSX, and arcade games, sought their own piece of this undead pie and finished development on a side-scrolling action platformer. It would not only include the infamous Lord of Vampires, but his universal minions Frankenstein and the Mummy. It was one of their first titles for Nintendo. Castlevania was released on September 26, 1986 for the Famicom Disk System. America didn't see the NES version until May of the following year. It was known as Akumajo Dracula, or Demon Castle Dracula in Japan. Recent college graduate Kanuyo Yamashita composed the driving musical score, her first for the company. She went under the pseudonym James Banana in the game's infamously cryptic credits, leaving the rest of the staff largely unknown. Instead of the developers, the cast list credited campy puns of popular horror actors like Christopher Lee, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney and Son, Barbara Shelley, Max Schreck, Glenn Strange, Andre Morel, and John Carradine. Terence Fisher, the director of over two decades worth of monster cinema for Hammer Films, and Dracula's own author were also parodied. Dracula was Castlevania's central villain, but the game was an obvious homage to a wide history of horror cinema, complete with film strip sprocket holes on the title screen. Ending boss played a cameo straight from the movies. Medusa's inclusion is probably a reference to the Gorgon from 1964, while the first boss may come from 1933's The Vampire Bat. The Grim Reaper, shown in classic western form, might be a nod to Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. The player controlled Simon Belmont, or Simon Belmondo, a vampire hunter armed with a whip and whatever weapon he could bust out of a nearby candle. A dagger, holy water, axe, watch, and cross lasted until death, or another weapon was picked up. Using them spent hearts, and the whip had to be upgraded twice at the beginning and after each life ticked away. Castlevania was not a long game. Speedrun records ranged between 12 and 13 minutes. Players originally took much longer than that due to the castle being quite the unforgiving challenge, with Frankenstein and death dishing out most of the difficulty. Castlevania did not crack the top 50 best-selling games on the system, but it did receive ports and remakes aplenty. It was re-released for the Nintendo PlayChoice 10 and Versus series of arcade machines, PC, Amiga, and Commodore 64 versions launched in 1990, the Game Boy Advance saw a portable port in 2004, and it joined the Wii Virtual Console Library in 2007. On Halloween in 1986, it was released as a port for the MSX2, a year before the original Metal Gear would arrive on the platform. It was renamed Vampire Killer, and required players to collect keys that opened doors and chests. The environments, while featuring the same art and sound design, had to be ventured screen by screen, instead of scrolling like the Famicom. Two years later, an arcade port dubbed Haunted Castle took a much more drastic departure from the original, pulling music from many other games in the franchise. The Sharp X68K, first released in 1987, gave Dracula a home in 1993 with an alternate visual style to match the updated hardware. This version flew over to the PlayStation as Castlevania Chronicles in May of 2001.
That's one game re-released and reimagined ten times, but none of those would have ever seen the light of day if Castlevania hadn't reanimated itself with additional installments. In 1986, the NES was beginning to gain momentum, and many fans bit by the series wanted more. Despite seeing the fortress crumble in the distance, it would be rebuilt. Castlevania was cursed to continue. Castlevania II Simon's Quest was released on August 28, 1987. Again, it graced the Famicom before reaching the NES in December of 1988. Kenichi Matsubara stepped in to handle the score, and H. Akamatsu filled the director's chair. The sequel appeared on the second issue of Nintendo Power, and drew complaints from parents for Dracula's decapitated head. The gameplay differences were discovered by players instantaneously as Simon first appeared in a residential area full of patrolling townsfolk. Each of them had something to say, similar to the villagers added to Zelda in The Adventure of Link released earlier the same year. They sold items and dropped clues as to how to complete the titular task, recover five remnants of Dracula's corpse, resurrect the immortal demon, and vanquish him for good. Hearts returned as the default currency, but they also leveled up Simon at certain intervals similar to experience points. The whip had four upgrades now instead of two, and they were permanent. The dagger was given two upgrades, gold and silver, and the diamond and sacred flame joined the arsenal, replacing the axe and watch. Garlic revealed secrets, laurels provided brief invincibility, and other trinkets like the cross and colored crystals opened hidden passages. Simon was also free to venture left as well as right, with the seven hubs connected by forests, caverns, bridges, and rivers. To imitate the passage of time, the game would alternate between night and day. Citizens were only available to talk during the daytime, and monster health doubled after the sun went down. Each of Dracula's possessions was sealed inside a mansion. An oak stake needed to be bought in each one before the trophy could be unlocked, at which point the player marched out the way they came. <laughs> Some fans weren't sure what to make of Simon's Quest. The clues were vague to say the least, so its guide became mandatory reading. The backtracking bumped up the playtime to several hours, with the fastest run clocked in at around 40 minutes. There were many NPC quips that were severely lost in translation, not to mention a prominent reoccurring spelling error. Simon faced Dracula's two forms during a tense standoff in the first Castlevania, but merely needed to lay on his whip as the vampire formed at the end of the sequel to claim victory. Just like other slowly evolving 8-bit franchises, the RPG elements were a necessary, if clumsy, step. Castlevania II enjoyed enough success to warrant calling the Belmonts into battle once more. But Simon's quest was over, and he would sit the next adventure out. Castlevania III Dracula's Curse was released on December 22, 1989, and entered the U.S. market nine months after its Japanese launch. Akamatsu returned as director, and Hidenori Mazawa, Jun Funahashi, and Yuki Morimoto shared the duty of composing the music. The third installment's protagonist, Trevor, was Simon's ancestor, and the events were played as a prelude to Castlevania I. After the first couple of screens, it looked like Dracula's Curse regressed to the original format. The town's structure vanished, large wooden doors led to most new zones, and the familiar arsenal of weapons returned unchanged. Even Trevor looked nearly identical to his supposed offspring. The game initially played like another lengthy linear trial with 15 stages as opposed to the original's mere six. But players soon discovered that there were also a good deal of important decisions to make. The first was which path to choose when the tattered map offered two alternatives. One traveled farther than the other in terms of overall progression, but both inevitably reached the same point. 
The second was the unexpected inclusion of three additional playable characters, Grant, Sifa, and Alucard. All three were unlocked after specific boss battles. Trevor then could choose whether to team up or separate. The press of the select button swapped control from Trevor to whichever hero was by his side. Grant, the thief, could walk on walls and ceilings and carried a small blade. Sifa, the sorcerer, wielded three forms of spells, and Alucard, the long-lost son of the big vamp himself, could take to the air as a bat and fire off the spread attack. Allies could be traded for new ones met on the journey and taken all the way up to the final boss encounter. Castlevania III was a successful fusion of the first two games. It recaptured the linear simplicity of the first, while adding that dash of creative variety to each playthrough that Simon's Quest failed to provide. Interestingly, while many NES games from Japan were being heavily censored in the US, many of the religious images in Dracula's Curse went untouched. Only a few nude statues were covered up, and some gameplay tweaks were made that made the game tougher. It's often the other way around. Project 51 Productions obtained the rights to produce a direct DVD animated feature based on the story of Dracula's Curse, but as of now, the project is on hold. Castlevania didn't reach the phenomenal sales numbers of other NES legends like Zelda and Metroid, or even financially surpass other horror franchises like Ghost and Goblins while on the 8-bit console. But this new series did set forth a tradition of evil, led by an undead icon that could return an indefinite number of times, and no one would question why or how. The franchise would have to continue its metamorphosis, and Konami's league of expert vampire hunters were ready for an even greater challenge. Part 2 of the Castlevania Retrospective, Dracula's Domain is regrown in even greater resolution. The first game gets another honored retelling, the series tries to tie itself closer to Bram Stoker's novel, and the prodigal son composes a sweet, side-scrolling symphony. No. 